Rama asked. Lord, you know all the truths. When the ego sense is dissolved in the mind, by what signs does one recognize the nature of sattva? So when the ego has weakened, how do we know, how do we recognize this state of purity known as sattva? Sattva is the third option. It's normally mentioned along with rajas and tamas. Rajas and tamas are a duality. Rajas is excitement, passion. And tamas is dullness, inertia. Rajas wants to know. Tamas doesn't want to know. Rajas wants to know conceptually. So we've got this choice. We've got Rajas, which could be considered conventional inquiry. And Tamas is not wanting to know. The third option is Sattva. And Sattva could be described simply as being. It's being devoid. This is according to Encyclopedic Dictionary of Yoga by George Forstein. Sattva is the psychocosmic principle of lucidity or sheer existence devoid of conceptual filters and emotional overlays. And that's a great way of putting it. Devoid of conceptual filters and emotional overlays. You can sometimes, it's something I haven't explored or touched on fully yet. I've often spoken about realization as being beyond beliefs and concepts, beyond our notions. That's quite simple, but often what you find when you go beyond that, you're still left in a mood. There's still a coloring, an emotional coloring. And the real challenge is getting beyond that emotional coloring. Sometimes you can feel that you're there. You've got this absolute perspective, but there's still an emotional coloring. There's still a mood. There's still a very subtle vasana from which you want to regard things rather than look through this vasana or mood, this emotional coloring. So sattva is beyond emotional coloring. The sister said, Such a mind, O Ram, is untouched by sins like greed and delusion, even under the worst of provocation. Virtues like delight in the prosperity of others do not leave the person whose ego sense has been dissolved. The knots of mental conditioning and tendencies are cut asunder. Anger is greatly attenuated and delusion becomes ineffective. So notice anger doesn't disappear, it becomes attenuated. Desire becomes powerless, greed flees, the senses function on an even keel, neither getting excited nor depressed. Even if pleasure and pain are reflected on his face, they do not agitate the mind which regards them all as insignificant. The heart rests in equanimity. So there might still be pleasure and pain, but somebody who's centered in being, in the field of experiencing, is processing that differently at a deep level. And we've got to be careful with this kind of paragraph. This is not a, a checklist for ascertaining whether someone is liberated or not. That That's not an issue. This whole idea of trying to decide whether somebody is enlightened or not is one of these red herrings of the so-called spiritual path. All we need to be concerned about is our own liberation. We take what is necessary for our own liberation. We don't take somebody else's words on the basis of the belief whether they're liberated or not. This can be a big stumbling block. You want a teacher, you, you, you want spiritual awakening, you feel you need a teacher, you can't do it by yourself. But how do you find this teacher? You have to decide if they're liberated or not. So you need to get your checklists out 
and you can scurry around all the, the great gurus and find out if they're liberated by applying your checklist and then you can proudly declare yes this guru is enlightened I am with this guru now and you pin your colours to that guru's mast that's a lot of nonsense and then you're going to follow this guru's teachings and you'll follow this guru's teachings because they come from this guru that you've declared to be a guru rather than measuring this guru's words by their own validity this is a huge mistake this kind of paragraph is really for one who is making some kind of spiritual progress to measure themselves, to test themselves any notion that you've got any kind of spiritual insight should always be tested and you don't test it for the sake of gratifying yourself as to whether you've got spiritual insight or not you test it in order to deepen it spiritual insight is an ongoing process of realization and deepening becoming more established in one's own being it's so easy to get deluded about this so it has to be constantly challenged constantly tested and that's what this paragraph is for this is what Ram's question is about his ego sense is weak but how does he know he's really pure or how does he know he's really in touch with essential sattva essential purity and the sister has given him an answer the enlightened man who is endowed with all these virtues effortlessly and naturally wears the body being and non-being like prosperity and adversity when they follow each other creating diverse and even great contradictions do not generate joy and sorrow in the holy ones Woe unto him who does not tread this path to self-knowledge, which is within reach, if he directs his intelligence properly. The means for crossing this ocean of samsara and for the attainment of supreme peace are inquiry into the nature of the self. Who am I? And of the world, what is this world? And of the truth, what is truth? And that's an important question, isn't it? These three questions are extremely important especially the latter, what is truth? We tend to think of the truth as a notion, as a belief, which we can hit others over the head with. That truth is not a notion. Truth is not something that you can enter into debate with, with somebody else. Well, this is spiritual truth I'm talking about. There's other kinds of truth which have their own modes of debate, their own context. But spiritual truth is not something which can be conceptualized. And if it is conceptualized, then the challenge is to go beyond that conceptualization. <laughs>